Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Caroline Tony Noland, and I am a program manager at CPQCC, the California Perinatal Quality Care Collaborative. And we're really excited that you're here with us today for our webinar on Eat Sleep Console. This is hosted by the Maternal Substance Exposure Database, uh, MADEX. Um, yeah, and we're glad to have you with us. I'm gonna go ahead and launch a poll just to see where everyone is. So today, this is our brief overview. Um, I'm gonna give you a two minute um, overview of the MADEX database. And we'll share some exciting research that's just come out around increasing mother's own milk at discharge. Um, we'll have a presentation on ESC, Eat Sleep Console, to sort of lay a foundation of what is this, um, what are some of the key components of it. And then the main part of today's webinar is going to be a Q&A with practitioners who are doing this every day. Uh, and then we'll have a, a quick wrap up. So it looks like many of you have voted in the poll. So I'll go ahead and give that about two seconds more and then I'll end it. Thank you for participating. Share those results. So it looks like a lot of you are considering implementing Eat Sleep Consult in your hospital. Um, the next majority is you've started to implement it and the rest of you are either fully implementing it uh, or you've sort of thought about it but are really curious to know more. So you're all in a really great place to be. So this is a snapshot of the Maternal Substance Exposure database, the MADEX database. It's optional and it's free. It's part of the CPQCC. Uh, and so by collecting data on maternal substance exposures, which include but aren't just limited to opioids, we really aim to improve the healthcare of exposed newborns by focusing on forms of treatment and length of stay in the hospital. Uh, so many of our members use it to collect data who have been exposed to all different substances and some to just focus on opioids, it's really up to the hospital. So these are some of the indicators that are collected. This is a brief example of the Maddox report site where you can compare your hospital to other Maddox participating hospitals. Um, I think as of earlier this week, we have about 32 hospitals across California and over 600 infant records that are available. So this data is really used to drive uh, improvements in care uh, that's provided to exposed infants. Uh, so we hope that these reports help hospitals identify areas of high and low performance uh, and monitor the effects of improvement interventions uh, as you do quality improvement and research work. Again, it's free and it's available to you, but you do have to request access and um, so at the end of this webinar, you'll be sent an evaluation. You can enter your email there and we'll follow up. You can send me your email in the chat as well. Uh, and I'll be sure to follow up with you. Here's just a quick picture of some data that's relevant to today's webinar. Uh, so of the infant records that we have in the database, 92% are cared for in the NICU at some point during their stay. 17% are cared for in well baby. We think this is a little skewed because CPQCC is a primarily NICU-centered organization. So we're sure that there are more babies being cared for in well baby, um, but this is the data that we have. In terms of receiving some non-pharmacologic treatment, it's almost every infant. Um, the next question in the database sort of specifies whether Eat Sleep Console or a similar approach has been used. That's about 37% among infants with NAS or NALS. So we'll use NAS and NALS interchangeably today, neonatal abstinence syndrome and neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. So when you see those today, know that we're using those interchangeably. Uh, in terms of receiving some pharmacologic treatment, that number is at about 66%. So I'd like to pass the mic now to uh, Teresa, since she is one of our research assistants uh, with Maddox and with CPQCC. And over the past year, she has been working on some analysis with the Maddox data and is going to uh, share her findings with you today. 
Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Caroline, for the introduction. Um, again, my name is Teresa, and I am excited to share with you my research and findings with you today. Um, using the Maternal Substance Exposure Database, the objective of my research was to analyze factors that impact receipt of mother's own milk at discharge among California infants diagnosed with um, NAS or NAUS. I used the data from January 2019 to December 2020. And um, there were about 20 participating hospitals at all level three or level four NICUs. Um, within these 245 infants with NAS were identified. Um, the results of my research showed that increased likelihood of being discharged on a mother's own milk included mothers who were on maternal medication assisted treatment, mothers who use addiction services, infants who receive donor human milk, and rooming in and kangaroo care were also a factor in infants being discharged on mother's own milk. Um, these results suggest that supporting the mother-infant dyad and using non-pharmacologic treatment method increases the likelihood and use of mothers on milk at discharge. And through this research, I created a one-page educational flyer you can see on the screen with four potentially better practices for improving care for infants with NAS. This includes shifting um, your mindset and seeing that infants with NAS are not addicts and avoid stigma towards these mothers. Um, the second would be to use the, support the use of safe breast milk, supporting the mother-baby dyad is critical to improving infant outcomes. And third is to allow for rooming in, which allow for caregivers to bond with their infant. And lastly, um, is to encourage kangaroo care. This approach promotes the infant's ability to self-regulate and has shown to reduce symptoms of NAS. Um, this flyer right here or PDF will be available on the Umatics website as of today. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my research and findings. Thank you, Caroline. Thanks so much, Teresa. It's really exciting to know that the data that you're submitting is useful, not just for your own NICU to sort of measure your performance or how you're doing, but also for our broader community of NICUs. So I'll now introduce Lisa. She is a neonatologist at Kaiser Walnut Creek Medical Center. She's also one of our Maddox co-chairs, and she's going to give us a short introduction to Eat Sleep Console before we jump into our Q&A session with our panelists. If you do have any questions for Lisa or for our panelists, you can submit those through the Q&A function. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, so today I just wanted to provide you with an overview of Eat Sleep Console, as well as going over some of the studies and papers that have been published. Uh, so next slide, please. So we really can't start a talk about withdrawal without acknowledging uh, the pioneer in this field, uh, which is Loretta Finnegan. So the story begins when she was evaluating a baby who was having respiratory distress and was really jittery. And she remembered that one of her teachers had mentioned uh, the differential diagnosis for a baby who was jittery would be intrauterine drug exposure. So she went to go talk to the mom, um, but only was told that the mom had left the hospital uh, to use heroin. And Dr. Finnegan wanted to learn more about withdrawal and how to manage babies. And when she went to comb the literature, really couldn't find anything. And this began her lifetime career then of helping moms with substance addiction as well as their families. And so in 1975, Dr. Finnegan published a groundbreaking Finnegan neonatal abstinence uh, scoring tool, which even today is the most widely used assessment tool for babies with withdrawal. Next slide. This is the Finnegan neonatal abstinence scoring tool, which I know all of you are familiar with. Uh, the Finnegan involves an assessment of 21 signs and symptoms to determine if a baby may need medical medication treatment. And as you can see, some of these items uh, like uh, hyperactive moro, uh, frequent yawning, nasal stuffiness, sneezing, just these items alone uh, can add up to six points in that score. And for many centers, the threshold to treat 
is a score of eight or more, uh, usually three times or 12 or higher uh, twice. And the question is, do these symptoms, the ones in red, uh, justify a baby receiving medication with methadone or morphine? The Finnegan assessment also requires that the baby's unswaddled and evaluated from head to toe, so potentially uh, a baby could be disturbed, which goes against the first-line treatment for withdrawal, which is really to focus on comforting and calming the baby. Next slide. The Finnegan score also has 21 subjective items, so commonly there is quite a bit of variability uh, between different raters. So the Finnegan, it's a very important first step uh, towards evaluating babies with withdrawal, um, but the question has been, is there potentially a, a better option now? Next slide. Dr. Grossman and his colleagues at Yale published this paper uh, in 2017, which discussed an innovative new way of approaching babies with withdrawal. Next slide. And they questioned whether it was time for a shift in how we think about these babies, a shift from a score-based more to a function-based uh, tool, and also moving from medication management to primarily non-pharmacologic care, and to shift from the physician being the lead on the baby's management to the parents really becoming uh, the main champions. Next slide. So let's take a look at the, the tools. The Finnegan, as we've talked about, has 21 items with um, high variability in scores between raters. Uh, babies are treated uh, for high scores based on symptoms and potentially requires disturbing uh, the baby. So the team at Yale came up with their own novel assessment tool, which they named Eat Sleep Console, which was simplified to three items. And the goal was to see if a baby's severity of NAS or, or NAUS was enough to affect what a baby normally should do, which is eat, sleep, and console. And much of this assessment can be done simply by observation alone. Uh, if a baby is inconsolable, it actually requires a baby or efforts be made to try to calm the baby for 10 minutes before they can be scored as inconsolable. So really, supporting non-pharmacologic care. Next slide. So here are the details on the Eat Sleep Console approach at Yale. Uh, there's an emphasis on non-pharmacologic care as first line. Uh, so parents were basically told, you are the baby's treatment. And they were expected to be present as much as possible uh, during the baby's hospital stay. And staff were also trained to see non-pharmacologic interventions as equivalent, as equal uh, to medication treatment. And a low stimulation, uh, low light, reduced noise environment was provided. Now, when they did the study at Yale, babies were evaluated with Finnegan in the well baby uh, nursery. If babies had a Finnegan of eight or higher, then they were transferred to the pediatric unit where they roomed in with their parents. And from here forward, all management was then guided by Eat Sleep Console. Next slide. This is the Yale Eat Sleep Console protocol. Uh, they evaluated whether a baby could eat at least one ounce uh, or breastfeed well could sleep at least one hour and be consoled within 10 minutes. So if a baby could do all of these things, they were considered to be doing well and no further interventions uh, were recommended. If there was difficulty in one or more items, then attempts were made to optimize uh, non-pharmacologic care. And if on subsequent evaluation, the baby still had difficulty with one or more items than medication treatment, and they used morphine on a PRN basis, uh, was then initiated. Next slide. With implementation of Eat Sleep Console at Yale, they saw a reduction in the treatment of these babies postnatally with morphine uh, from 98% to 14%, so a very drastic drop in their uh, percent of kids needing uh, medication. 
the average length of stay for all of their NOWS patients decreased from 22 days to just under six days. The breastfeeding rate at discharge improved to 20%, and the hospital cost decreased by 77%. They also looked at uh, whether there were any readmissions and in the 30 days after discharge, they did not find any. So in summary, with using Eat Sleep Console, uh, the babies at Yale had less exposure to opioid treatment postnatally and the hospital saw decreased utilization. And so suggesting that uh, the Finnegan may be a driver for over medication of these babies. Next slide. Many other centers have since uh, published on their experience with Eat Sleep Console. Uh, this figure shows the medication treatment rate among babies with NOWS. And you can see that um, when babies were treated with Finnegan in the darker blue and then switched to Eat Sleep Console guided management more in the teal color across the board, uh, there was a decrease in the percent of babies needing pharmacotherapy. Next slide. This figure shows the average length of stay among all babies uh, with NOWS. And here after implementation of Eat Sleep Console, again, we see at all centers that the average length of stay uh, was decreased. There, uh, most of these sites also looked at balancing measures. They did look at readmission and none of the sites uh, reported an increase in readmission within the 30 days after discharge. Uh, so it looks like Eat Sleep Console seems to improve outcomes for the patients, uh, but what is the parent's uh, perspective of this? Next slide. The group at Yale interviewed many of the families who were involved in their Eat Sleep Console study. And during the interviews, four themes kept recurring. Uh, one was that parents were very supportive of fewer interventions and the normalization of their baby's care. So one a mother said that, I, I guess they just wanted him to be doing stuff that normal babies were doing. Uh, there was another mom whose previous child had been managed with Finnegan and then the most recent uh, birth, her daughter, uh, was being managed with Eat Sleep Console. And she said in this middle quote, they didn't really check her as much as my son. They came in a lot and did the assessment with him a lot before, more than they did with her. He didn't like any of that. It was a lot for him. Uh, parents also felt very encouraged uh, to be the lead in their baby's care, uh, even though parents were now moving towards being the primary lead in the baby's management. Uh, they still felt unprepared for what to expect when the baby was actually born. So suggesting there's still room for uh, more anticipatory guidance uh, during uh, prenatal visits. There were many parents that still experienced feelings of guilt. Uh, they felt guilty that it was their fault that their babies uh, were having withdrawal. They were afraid of how severe the baby's withdrawal would be. Um, they did mention there was a lot of stress with the social work assessments. And I want to uh, note that regardless of whether the baby was managed with Finnegan or with Eat Sleep Console, with both tools, parents still reported uh, that they felt judged and stigmatized. Next slide. So you may have some other questions uh, that um, hopefully I can address here. One uh, may be, what care location works best with Eat Sleep Console? And in all the various studies that I briefly presented before, there were lots of different uh, sites where they took place. Uh, one center, did Eat Sleep Console exclusively in their mother baby unit. Uh, there's another center who they'll speak later today uh, where management was entirely in a level four NICU. Uh, the majority of these centers did a combination of mom, baby and NICU or mom, baby and pediatrics. And what medication should I choose to use with Eat Sleep Console? And these studies used a lot of different medications as first line, morphine, methadone, clonidine, phenobarbital. Uh, the, they all reported improvements in their outcome. Uh, the one that was most frequently reported or used was morphine. And similarly, morphine in a PRN uh, basis was also the most commonly used across the studies. The group from Boston did report uh, 
good outcomes with using methadone in a scheduled uh, fashion. So with these studies, uh, we see that babies in general seem to be receiving less exposure postnatally to opioids or to other medications for treatment. Uh, but generally, I would say that we are accepting a little bit more withdrawal as long as a baby can eat, sleep, and console. And what we don't know is, does this decreased uh, medication treatment but slightly increased withdrawal have any effects long-term? And there simply just aren't studies yet on this. Next slide. And the last thing I wanted to mention is that in every single study, Eat Sleep Console was always combined with some other intervention, either a change in the site of care to pediatrics or a change to morphine PRN or optimization of non-pharmacologic care. So it's really hard to tease out if the improvements that were seen were due primarily to one intervention or if the improvement was because a whole bundle of care uh, was needed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was excellent. Um, I hope that provided a good foundation for folks who are perhaps a bit less familiar with Eat Sleep Console um, or about all of the research that's since been done on that strategy. So we're now gonna switch into um, our Q&A for our panelists. Um, so I'm going to pass it off to Angela, who is also one of our Maddox co-chairs and she's going to facilitate this. Angela? You're muted still, sorry. Here I am talking to myself. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good afternoon. On behalf of the CPQCC Maddox Committee, thank you all for joining us today as we explore the research evidence behind eSleep Consult, as well as practical strategies for optimizing care for substance-exposed mother-infant diet. Our panelists today are Joanne Kohler from UCSF and Dr. Lee Trope from Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. Joanne Kohler is the neonatal clinical nurse specialist in the NICU at UCSF Children's Hospital Oakland and is, leads their ESC program. She received her master's degree from UCSF and has been working in neonatal care in the Bay Area for the last 40 years. Last week, she missed her final week of work before retirement due to an appendectomy. She will miss the babies, their families, and her amazing colleagues at UCSF, but is excited to share her experience with you today. Dr. Lee Trope is a pediatric hospitalist at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center and affiliated clinical instructor at Stanford University. Her extra clinical work focuses on the integration of maternal and child services and on substance use disorders in pregnant women, neonates, and adolescents. Joanna and Lee, thank you both for your time today. We're here, we're excited to hear about your experiences with ESC implementation in your respective hospitals and units. Could you begin with a brief introduction to your unit and your hospital? Joanna, let's start with you. Hey, thank you. And Lisa, thanks for that great overview. So when we first heard about um, Eat Sleep Console at a conference that Dr. Grossman presented this, um, we came back to our unit and we knew our length of stay was much higher than even they were at Yale, which was 22.4 days. Ours was 31.8 days for ESC babies. So in 2019, we decided our goal for 2020 was to really try to reduce that maybe by 50%. Um, we realized that there were lots of challenges and we wondered if we could really do this. Um, we're in a level four, 37 bed open bay unit. We have two smaller rooms um, and then one larger big room. Um, so we have no private rooms except one isolation room. I know there's no moms that deliver there. So all the babies are separated and brought to our unit after delivery, which really impacts the amount of maternal participation. And as Teresa presented earlier, you know, skin to skin and maternal participation rooming in are really some of the key concepts of Eat Sleep Console. So we really, you know, had to deal with those challenges. Um, unfortunately, the mothers had to overcome a lot of distance sometimes um, from where the baby and, you know, where the mother delivered to where the baby now was, you know, lack of transportation, no cars, money for public transportation, childcare. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with those 
challenges for our moms to be there all the time. So we did a, a literature review and presented a guideline to our neonatologists. We have a, um, close to 30 neonatologists in the group. We did a big, like I said, did a presentation and came up with a guideline for how we were going to implement this um, and primarily really implementing um, an increase in our non-pharmacologic care. So we had a non-pharmacologic care bundle and then our pathway for um, pharmacologic intervention. So we most first met with our neonatologist. Then we really needed to look at how we were going to um, fill in the spots where we didn't have mothers there all the time and with the lack of rooming in. So we first looked really at our volunteers and our increase in volunteer holding time. We were lucky enough at the time to have over 40 volunteers that worked from about 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. We implemented a project console where these babies became the high priority when our volunteers were in and um, they would automatically um, hold these babies at any time they were in the unit. They just became the priority. And every baby averaged about 35 hours, um, at least from volunteers during that time. Um, we also changed the bed location for our babies. We've made it much more of a priority to put these babies in the ISO room if there was no one in there or to put them in one of our smaller rooms in the back, away from the traffic, away from the charge desk, away from, you know, we have a tube system, just away and out of our biggest room and into the quietest location we could find. That really just became more um, on our radar that we really needed to think about that when we knew we were getting an NAS baby in. We did a lot of staff education. We did a lot of rollout um, of education. We created a lot of tips tip sheets. Um, we had monthly um, skills days around NAS and, and talking about the changes between the Finnegan and the, and the Eat Sleep Console. We still did Finnegan scoring because it was built into our algorithm in charting for staffing. So we still did that, but we did not treat by that. Um, and then we also, um, as part of our bundle, looked at um, the formula the baby was admitted on, really using a more hydrolyzed formula, say maybe a gentle ease, and then also just beginning um, diaper dermatitis treatment at, at admission. And then um, also began using an automated bed. Um, I don't know if people have heard of this new bed. We were lucky to have several of those. And um, implemented that all as a care bundle. So really trying to prioritize holding, limiting noise, um, looking at the feeding, um, you know, prevention of diaper derm, a lot of education and a lot of really mind shift to really non-pharmacologic care as the treatment with pharmacologic care as a backup. Um, people were originally saying, oh, we're just gonna not give these babies any medications. So that wasn't the point. Um, and is not really what ESC is per se, but after the baby would fail ESC or was still really exhibiting strong um, withdrawal characteristics, then we would have a huddle and discuss, are, there, are we maximizing our non-farm? Is there something else we could do um, for this baby before pharmacologic treatment? But if not, we certainly did um, do pharmacologic treatment and we switched from morphine as our primary um, drug to clonidine as our first line. And also I'm going to close up, just wanted to say too that we certainly try to encourage moms to come and be there as much as possible. Um, even if the mother was not going to um, have custody of the baby after they left, if there was a foster family identified early, they were really encouraged to come in and hold the baby. And if there was um, any members of the mother's family that were available and interested in coming in. So we did try to reach out to families um, um, and really try to get those mothers involved. Um, I think that's probably a good overview of uh, implementation. It's a challenge in an open bay NICU, a level four, but I think it, it's certainly doable. We've had great success. We've reduced our length of stay from 31.8 days down to 10 days and really dramatically improved our use of medications, decreased it tremendously. So I think um, it's been for me, one of the biggest changes in our um, care of, of infants in our NICU. So um, I think anybody can do it if we can pull it off. Thanks. Um, so hi everybody. I am Lee Trope. I'm one of the hospitalists, um, as Angela said, at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. It's the County Hospital of San Jose, for those of you who are unfamiliar. 
and we have a very different setup. So uh, it's like kind of a, a diversity of experience. Um, we have um, babies delivered at our hospital. We do have a well baby nursery. Um, and we implemented ESD, I think it's now been about a year, um, a little bit over a year. Um, and what we do at our facility is we try to keep the moms and babies together in the well baby nursery, um, if possible, sort of like the whole way through. And that, that, that's the case when they don't have any um, signs or symptoms of withdrawal on the ESD scoring, meaning they don't, um, they aren't um, failing on eat, sleep or inconsolability. Um, and we, we basically, we changed the length of stay for these babies in our well baby nursery to 72 hours. So we keep them um, for 72 hours to make sure that withdrawal doesn't develop. And if it doesn't, we just discharge them straight from the nursery, um, which obviously has decreased length of stay in that sense. Um, if they do need further intervention, so if they score on any one of the three components of eat sleep control as unable to do that, we have a decision tree that we can make there and we really do look at it on a case by case basis. So we either will send them to our NICU or to our pediatric ward. And we kind of base that decision on, um, you know, the severity, whether or not um, there is somebody that can do the non-pharmacological interventions, meaning, you know, mom or foster family is there, whether or not we have space in the NICU to be able to do that versus the pediatric ward. And then the census, like in each setting. Um, and we really do, we really do do it on a case by case basis, depending on what's going on. What's nice about our hospitals that hospitalists like me, our group, we work in all settings. We work in the NICU, we work in the nursery, we work in the pediatric ward. And so we're kind of familiar with ESD no matter where we are. Um, but what's been a challenge for us is that we have, we don't have a ton of opioid exposed infants, we, we, our population is much more uh, meth exposed. And so it has been a little bit challenging in that we don't get enough patients that people are kind of like restarting the, the sort of teaching process with every case. Um, and we've seen a lot of success by doing kind of just in time teaching. So you'll do a, you know, one of us will do a huddle or the, the hospitalist or the um, neonatologist will, will huddle with the nurse and kind of re go over what we're looking for uh, what we're going to do if we see those things, what the non pharmacological interventions are, um, kind of with each case, um, which has been, you know, challenging. I think when you don't have a lot of volume, you don't always get um, a lot, you don't really get to build on your previous cases as readily. And that still continues to be the case. I mean, we had, we, we, we don't do Finnegan scoring anymore. We just do eat, sleep, and school scoring. And I just discharged yesterday, um, an eat, sleep, and soul baby from our nursery that when I look, when I looked at the flow sheet, there's also Finnegan scoring somehow in there, um, despite the fact that, you know, we, we sort of got rid of it a year ago. Um, so it, it's still kind of a learning curve for us, but um, when it, you know, it has gone really well and it's it just a paradigm shift and especially for nursing, I think, instead of going, um, you know, item by item and having what feels like a more sort of objective scoring to really look at the big picture holistically, um, have a lot of communication, talk a lot to the family, empowering the family, like we've already talked about at length. Um, and it is really a paradigm shift and it's come um, easier in some, in some providers than others. So we're um, going to move over to the Q&A portion of today's webinar. As a reminder to everyone, please submit your questions for the panelists um, in the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. We'll try to answer as many as possible today. Um, we're going to start with the questions that were previously submitted. Um, so the first question is, can East Sleep Console be used with pharmacological treatment? Lee? Yeah, I mean, the short answer is absolutely. I think pharmacological, you know, um, it is, it is sort of a myth that you, don't, you know, the eat, sleep, and soul is not, pharmacological treatment is not a part of it. So what we did in our institution is we implemented a sort of PRN morphine protocol. And, um, if you've kind of optimized your non-pharmacological options, the baby is still not, let's say eating, eating or consoling sufficiently. Um, you, you've huddled about it and decided that, you know, we do need to try some morphine. We just do so on a PRN basis. We've had several cases that have needed one or two doses of morphine, and that's really it in their whole stay. So just because they, um, 
needs some morphine doesn't automatically set them on like a path where they're going to need to be slowly weaned from the morphine. The PRN has worked quite well for us. We, we have sort of a, an algorithm where we decide whether or not they need to go from PRN to standing and then how to wean that. And we have had a few cases that have needed to go to standing, um, standing morphine, but while you're giving this PRN morphine or even the standing morphine, you're still optimizing the non-pharmacological interventions. And it's been quite amazing to see how much it decreases the need um, for morphine. Jonas, do you have a comment to add on to that? Yeah, I think that's that's really true that it's a myth not to, but we really just yeah also do implement um, morphine PRN, or as I said, we've, we've been using clonidine um, PRN that, um, a lot at our suggestion of um, a physician anesthesiologist that's also runs our pain team, that he's been using that with great success for agitation and in older kids uh, for withdrawal and like our PICU. So, and um, we also are using that, but again, we start as PRN and only really um, move to standing if we really can't get the baby under control. But we also really assess what is the area that they're not succeeding in? If they're not eating, we may just put an NG tube in and give them a few day, you know, few feeds that way versus starting medication. So we try to just really assess what the baby is showing us and how we can deal with that. Obviously, if they're not sleeping at all, then they need some pain. You know, I mean, that they need an, an intervention, a pharmacologic intervention. So I think we just really assess more the baby um, and then decide which way to go. But yeah, certainly we've had babies on both PRN and round the clock. I see that we have a lot of questions coming in through the Q&A. So move on to the next question. How do you get hospital administration on board in terms of costs, staffing, resources, and time? And I think this is a really hot um, topic. A lot of the um, questions are coming in along this line. So we'll go with John. You know, probably Lee can address this better because we don't have, um, deliveries. So we haven't had to change much of our staffing. Our ratios in our NICU are all um, two to one. So there's one nurse for two babies. And so we just, they're in one of our assignments. That's how they're staffed in our unit. So we didn't have to, you know, we didn't change anything. So I don't think that I have anything really to offer to that. Yeah, I mean, I think, Angela, you can speak a little bit. Angela um, works at my institution and did a little bit of the back end with administration. So there was a little bit of a staffing ratio change for us in the NICU, I believe, which, um, Angela, you can expand on. But in the nursery, you know, having that 72-hour minimum length of stay was the major difference. I and mean, we have some moms that leave, obviously, much sooner than that. Um, but, you know, this wasn't the only indication or reason that we would keep someone that long. So it really wasn't that tough of a... Uh, a sell in that regard. And especially when you look at the length of stay data, I think that's quite compelling to administrators um, when you're trying to make the case for implementation of ESC. But Angela, I'll let you kind of talk about the ratio. Um, so I work in Santa Clara Valley Medical Center in NICU. What we did do, we did increase the acuity on these um, NAS infants, uh, the babies for us. Uh, and it depends on their scoring and the severity of the withdrawal especially if they do um, go on PRN morphine or standalone PR uh, or a continuous morphine. Uh, we do manage them as much as possible in an isolation room when that's not them um, to decrease the noise stimulation. When that's not possible, they are in um, a, I think in nursing parlance, a, a two baby assignment. Um, some of it is we do, and I, I can go ahead and jump into one of the questions that's coming up, um, which is that, uh, how do we manage these patients in a non-single room NICU? Um, we have parent rooms, and so for these moms, for the moms with NALS, we have them um, room in, and so they come in, and so the baby are actually in the room with them. Um, we do have nurses assigned who periodically check in with them, and this is how we can provide that support and that education with them rooming in. And if the, for whatever reason the mom's not able to room in, then they are um, encouraged very strongly to come in as much as possible to be at the bedside. Um, and those are the restrictions you will run into with any non-single room uh, making. Mm -hmm. um, and so the next question we're moving on to, how to use the assessment tool with late preterm infants who may already have some issues with eating and sleeping or other infant population or maternal um, considerations. Um, so Lee, you wanna take that one? This, this is a really common question. Um, 
and a really common thing that we need to troubleshoot when we are doing ESD. Um, you know, the, the key point, I think, is that when you talk about each of these definitions, and eating is the one we have the, we struggle the most with, is you're really trying to assess, is the poor eating due to NAS? Um, and, and, you know, one way to do that is to exclude other possibilities. So, you know, we wouldn't indicate that there is a poor eating um, if it's clearly due to prematurity or transitional sleepiness in the first 24 hours. Or, you know, mom has mom and babies and like, mom has like an anatomical difficult latch. Um, so you really, you really do need to take the, the scoring in context. Like is the trouble feeding, you know, is this baby more than 24 hours old and they're really not coordinating their suck and they're having other signs or symptoms of withdrawal. And it really does seem like that's the reason that they're not able to coordinate and eat in, in appropriately when they're hungry in 10 minutes. Um, and so a premature, you know, we, we you, you sort of need to know what a normal premature baby, uh, what, what you would expect from a normal premature baby. And if it's seeming like out of that, the ordinary, and there's other sort of signs or symptoms of withdrawal, um, you can attribute it. Once in a while, we do get a little bit stuck. And we're like, you know, the baby's really not eating while well. we've given them time. Um, it seems like it could be due to withdrawal. Why don't we try a PRN morphine and see if it helps? And, and that really does help to, de to determine whether or not that was part of it. You know, we had a recent baby who we would try the morphine and, and it didn't change anything. And it was clear that that wasn't the main reason why the baby wasn't eating well. But it does get tricky. And it's another example of why this is a little bit more of a case by case, really thinking about the holistic care of the dyad and the patient. Um, and it's not as simple as like the score is this, so this, um, and is more or less challenging depending on who you're working with. Yeah, if I can just add to that, I mean, I think it's really, this is kind of more of an art than a science per se with these babies. It's really spending that time assessing really closely those three things, what's happening with the baby. We occasionally too, when we've just been up against the wall, gotten our OT involved to really assess the baby suck and things too, when we've been able to, you know, rule out other things. But yeah, I think just the really assessing and talking about it at the bedside um, is really necessary for these babies. So I'm going to consolidate some of the questions are coming in from the Q&A, one, one of which is how have you dressed, addressed polysubstance use drug exposure and use of ESC protocols? For example, methamphetamine, SSRI, THC, all of these are um, commonly seen polysubstance use that may um, muddle the uh, withdrawal picture in an infant. And it kind of goes along. I think there were several questions on whether you can US, use ESC in non-opiate non exposed infants. So I can start with that one as well. Um, very, very common in our institution to have both opioid exposure and meth exposure. And it's something that that's been a challenge for us because the babies um, you know, who are meth exposed tend to be very sleepy in the first day and they're not really feeding in, in first days and they're not really feeding well. And we're kind of like, is this, you know, what's going on here. And, um, and it's again, kind of the same principles that it, as I kind of answered in the last part where you really do need to think like, you know, it seems like this baby still has meth on board. Um, one, we sometimes we'll put in an NG tube and kind of wait for that. If they're not feeding away for the meth to clear out and, and sort out, you know, does this seem like it, the opioid, the opioid withdrawal is contributing. Uh, we don't treat meth withdrawal in neonates with morphine. Um, we would only do that for opioid withdrawal. And so it, it, it's, it, you know, the, the withdrawal syndromes in, in neonates, they do look different. Um, and so if the baby's looking more like really tired, it's not that they're having a poor coordination. They're just like not really wanting to go to the breast. It, it, it seems like more of a meth picture. We just give it time. And, and time is really your friend with ESC. Um, babies tend to declare themselves one way or the other. Um, and if you need to give them a little bit of um, food via NG tube or, or um, otherwise in the, be, in the first few days while that's being sorted out, um, that's okay too. Um, I, the other question was about, um, you know, meth, for us it's meth and, and opioids. It's like meth and opioids, meth and opioids is like the most common thing. We actually, and this is like probably a, a, a answer for a different webinar, but we actually, um, about a year and a half ago, we stopped um, testing for THC 
Um, we do ask about it and we do do a lot of counseling around breastfeeding um, around it, but we don't um, test for it. And we probably um, are missing some cases, but we don't classically see um, as, as much of a withdrawal syndrome with THC as we do with methamphetamine and opioids. So um, it hasn't, that hasn't been a major issue. And so the next question is, we're, um, both would like you both to answer is, um, with COVID, decreased parent visitation, um, decreased volunteer presence, um, how are the units coping with this? How are we managing ESC um, with all of this um, restriction, especially now the, the new CDPH guideline reducing um, visitors into the hospital? Um, I can address that. Um, yeah, when our volunteers had to start stop coming to our NICU, it was a major challenge. Um, luckily, they've started back about two weeks ago. But we've really just had to, again, try to come up with other ways. I mean, um, the nurses would carry the babies around. A resident would put a baby in a front pack um, and carry the baby. I mean, we just really find that the more these babies are held. So we really worked with those families to really try to get the mom or foster mom or a family member, um, even through COVID, at least have one reliable person that would come in and hold the baby for um, hours a day if we could get that. But it's been a challenge, definitely, without um, our volunteers during COVID. And some of the moms themselves actually were COVID positive and weren't able to visit anyway for several weeks, even if they were going to be doing all the you know, the care for the baby and assuming the care of the baby. So it, it's been a challenge. I, I do think that our, our bed has really helped a lot. Um, those babies seem to sleep better and, and, um, and are quieter. I'll just say that we started this during COVID. So I'm assuming that when COVID is done, we'll have a much easier time. <laughs> Having a NICU in our NICU, we, uh... We accommodate, we pass the babies around from staff to staff, from, you know, from uh, physicians, seniors, to um, nurses, nurse managers, um, take the village, right? Um, so we're moving on to the next question. Um, there, so there's what, one center is saying that they wait five days to observe for signs of withdrawal. How come we're only doing it for 72 hours? We and Joanne. So, you know, it's, it's, it basically, you know, we reviewed the literature and kind of came to, um, you know, the majority of babies uh, do develop some signs or symptoms of withdrawal at 72 hours. The exception to that is methadone exposed um, babies. And for those babies, we might watch a little bit longer, although our um, uh, substance use OB providers typically switch moms from methadone to buprenorphine, which we are seeing much more of. Um, in our pregnant women. So it's, it hasn't really come up very pragmatically as an issue. Um, but um, overwhelmingly, most of these babies are going to present in some form um, before 72 hours, which is where that decision tree came from. But I know there's many institutions that watch longer. Um, how how to work with families? So one of the questions are coming in multiple times is everyone wants to know how are we working with families who aren't compliant um, or are in withdrawal themselves? Um, and how and then the other this the addition to that is how long did it take both your both your centers to implement ESC? Um, and this is kind of roping into when the parents aren't involved, whether these are foster care or um, for CPS reasons, they are not there. Um, how are we, you know, get things, uh, or the ones in recovery themselves? Yeah, I think it's, it's uh, I mean, this has always been a, a challenging population, I think. I, I agree that we really try to reach out to the mom and really, as I think was presented earlier um, by Lisa, that the mom now can be the treatment, that what is done has kind of happened, but you really can help this baby get through the withdrawal. And I think trying to help our staff be non-judgmental, and I know mothers still report really feeling judged, and I think, you know, really trying to work with our social workers and our staff um, to be as non-judgmental and really urge the mother to come in and help as much as possible. Um, but it's a really challenging, um, 
population to deal with. And um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, it's challenging population. I think it takes all of us too to have a consistent message to the mother. We also have a tip sheet that we put at the bedside for how the mother can help. It's mostly all of our non-pharmacologic interventions, our bundle. And then we ask the parent to note anything else that helps their baby. But I think if they're there visiting to really talk to them about ESC and the tips and things that they can do and how they can help the baby is, the, is um, what we've tried to do. So if a parent is not available in your, or in situations where you have foster care, who would take the lead on the ESC um, care? The, the, the foster parent. Um, so we've had a lot of success with the foster parents coming in early and being identified and coming in early. Oftentimes it's like a kinship, a, an aunt or an uncle or, um, or, or a grandmother, and they'll come in and be our lead um, ESC person. Um, so that that's kind of a really um, helpful piece of it. And then even if we have, I mean, there's just, there's a, a brief story I'll tell of a a mom who um, whose baby was uh, having, um, you know, we were doing eat, sleep, console. Mom was using heroin throughout the pregnancy. Actually, left sort of like the anecdote told earlier. Actually, left the hospital six hours after delivery, um, you know, um, and identified sort of the, the foster parents were identified as uh, distant relatives from Seattle. They drove down right away. They were young and sort of intimidated. They hadn't had kids before. And, um, and then we had to just like somehow find mom to get her to sign the birth certificate so that like the adoption could, and I'll just never forget that this moment where I walked into the room and the baby was like crying and crying, you know, that high pitched cry and the, the foster parents were totally uh, overwhelmed and the mom was at the bedside and the nurse was trying to console the baby and the mom was like, bring the baby to me, bring the baby to me, bring the baby. And she seemed like, uh, you know, slightly altered and everybody's kind of looking at each other, like, is this okay? And the nurse kind of walked over, brought the baby to mom. Mom sort of like took off her shirt, put the baby skin to skin, and the baby just immediately quieted down. It was like quite striking. And it was just, um, I think a really uh, important example that just because, you know, a lot of times just because these moms are not gonna take this baby home, um, doesn't mean that they can't be involved in the ESC. Um, and, you know, obviously that's gonna be case by case. If they're not physically present, they can't be involved. But even in this, small instance we had the foster family there we were trying to teach them and then she sort of sort of showed them by example and from then on you know you had the the foster dad with his shirt off in the room like the whole time with the baby right on skin to skin so um there's you have to be creative um but um you know depending on the situation you can have multiple different people get involved okay looks like we have time for just one more question um this is a very general question. Um, what advice would you give to a center to starting to, or hoping to implement ESC in the near future? And we'll start with Lee. Um, you know, I think, I think probably uh, the advice I would give is, you know, get the, get, obviously just like any sort of intervention and change in practice, get the leadership on board. Um, then once that's the case, um, I think just having patience with the process, it, it is a paradigm shift. And I've said this a few times, it feels like a paradigm shift for the people um, doing the scoring. It's very different and it's not as, um, it's not as straightforward, I think, as Finnegan scoring. And so um, case by case, little huddles, um, we have printouts of the definitions of what does eating mean? What does sleeping mean? What does consoling mean with like literal amount of time we'd expect a baby to console and what are the non-pharmacological interventions? And just going through it that with every case, especially if you're in a center like ours where you're not um, seeing this every single day so that everybody's kind of getting more and more familiar. Um, so I would say, you know, leadership buy-in, patience, and a lot of communication um, and uh, sort of like just-in-time teaching um, has been, and I think we're still sort of in that process right now. So that's been what's uh, led us to continue in, um, in our success. Yeah, not a lot to add to that. Those were good suggestions. I, I think that having the resources available ahead of time, um, getting your a key team together of nurse, you know, some nurse um, advocates, champions, and um, a few physicians, or at least one of each um, that are going to meet at each 
baby's bedside when those babies are admitted. Make sure the resources are there and to touch base throughout the days, several times a day with how are things going? What are your issues? What are your concerns? Um, we also reviewed all these babies monthly at our nursing leadership meetings and in staff meetings and in just huddles. We, we really reviewed the cases as they were occurring and afterwards really looking at what changes needed to be made and what was working and what wasn't working. So I think just really staying on top of them, um, I would give at least a year. Um, it really felt like it took at least a year for the nurses to really kind of understand um, this change. And, um, but now I feel like it's been really successful and it's just kind of part of our you know routine care and people, I don't hear anymore a lot of the original questions and issues that I heard in the beginning about we're just letting these babies go cold turkey, you know, we're not giving any medication, um, those kinds of comments that I got in the beginning. So I think give yourself it's patience and a lot of time like any other major change in care that we do. But I think staying in constant touch with the, every patient that comes in um, ha has been really helpful. So as a final message, I see a lot of the questions in the Q&A regarding using um, ESC to treat um, methamphetamine, THC exposed babies. So a ESC in, it was was um, designed to choose op to treat opiates um, to assess opiate exposed infants. That being said, I think the fundamentals and that's embedded in ESC, all the parent support education is applicable to all newborns, low stimulation, skin to skin, bonding. And I think the decision tree is whether the baby is withdrawing enough that in, impacts their functional ability. And that would go down your opiate decision and treatment decision tree. So it's um, the, the ESC content should be applicable to all newborn, whether they're exposed, non-exposed. Um, and thank you all for your time today. I uh, just want to let you know, everyone um, who has submitted questions, we'll do our best to address them in the follow-up email that we'll send out to everyone. And the link to all these um, slides will be shared um, after the presentation. And I'll turn the mic back to Caroline. Thank you so much, everyone. And so as we've mentioned today, Eat, Sleep, and Soul is one portion of care for infants with NAS or NAUs. Um, so nastoolkit.org is an excellent resource. I think I sent across the link in response to someone's question earlier, um, but I would definitely suggest checking it out if you haven't already. Um, thank you to all of the speakers and the panelists. Um, it has been really wonderful and a great learning opportunity for myself as well uh, to better understand some of the questions and concerns that are coming up. If you are interested in participating in the MADEX database and getting started collecting your own data on infants with substance exposures, please submit a help ticket at cpqcchelp.org um, or to, uh, you can send your email across in the chat and I'll note it down. Um, but we would love to welcome you into our MADEX family. We can give you some uh, more access to different webinars and learning materials and to really help you get started on your journey on improving care. Um, for infants with NAS or NAS. Thank you so much everyone for joining us today and hope you have a great rest of your week.